Hello guys, welcome to this week's video, how to train your barn owl. First things first, if you're working with any owl and you've bought that owl and it's been parent reared and not a hand reared imprint, more or less, the best thing to say is, do not buy or obtain that bird if you want to train it to fly. It's cruelty. An owl's brain works very different to the diurnal raptors and the only kind way to work with any owl is to hand rear that bird and imprint it on humans yourself. That way, while it's an owlet, a baby owl that, can no longer, or can, that can't fly yet, hasn't got its adult flying feathers, you can take that bird everywhere you go. We use clear stack and store boxes. We line them with towels so their legs don't splay. You can't have a shiny newspaper base in their uh, imprinting enclosure. Their legs will splay and they're growing so fast, they'll grow deformed. So make sure it's got something to grip on in there that you can change and clean regularly. And once it's old enough to be away from the heat source, we take our owls, if they're gonna be school visit owls to do school education, we'll take them with us from sort of four week old owlets upwards. And that way, you can get your owl used to all of the environments hopefully it's going to be working in or trained in when it's old enough to fly that's critically important their brains are so different from other birds of prey if you were to put a really well trained imprinted owl in an aviary for a year and you did nothing with it at all apart from feed it, it even that owl that was perhaps once good at its job can take weeks and weeks to get its head back around being with a human and being out in the human world. They're very strange things. So tip number one really, you can't eat leaves, is you do need to imprint and hand rear an owl if you're going to work with it. Now, how to house your owl once it's ready to fly, we've touched on that in other of our videos. So we're really talking about training today. I hand rear my owl, bear in mind, at 10 to 12 weeks a barn owl is completely fully grown. I let my barn owls grow up fully and fully fledge before I do any real training with them. That's one way of doing things. My colleagues, they actually, when they hand rear their owls, even when the owl's just a few weeks old, they'll encourage it to walk to them across the floor or just one side of their rearing enclosure to the other for a bit of food. So they're training them to come for food at a much younger age than I do. Both ways work, so don't worry too much if you haven't done what my colleagues do and you haven't encouraged the owl to walk for food even before it can fly. The important thing is let that owl see and experience as much as you possibly can while it's a chick growing up, an owlet. By the way, this is Plop. Plop is 10 years old. I've had her from a two week old owlet. She's 10 years old and she's been doing her job, mostly school education and flying outside at country shows now for all of those years. More than any of the other animals I work with, owls are birds or animals of habit and routine. If they're doing a similar thing in a similar place every day, they're so happy and relaxed. You could train your owl to fly beautifully in a lovely quiet country field and be the most obedient owl that loves to be with you flies brilliantly and yet you could take that owl to a different field just as quiet let alone one with people and dogs and horses and that owl will sit in a tree and will not move at all because it's frightened of the new environment here. We've got to use Plop and pretend she's a young fledged fledgling owl and first things first you're going to train that owl on the clearance. Now if you rear your owl in your house or in its aviary you can certainly do the basic training in that environment but soon you need to get it outside and if you're flying your owl outside for training you need a clearance line you need that securely attached to the owl's jesses with a couple of falconers knots if you don't know what a falconers knot is i really hope you haven't bought your owl yet you need to do a lot more research about the basic stuff a couple of falconers knots attached to the jesses when you're using a clearance line you don't have to get the owl to fly or ask the owl to fly very far you're looking for a reasonably quick response without any nerves. You're not necessarily looking for it to go very far. For me, for any of my birds, 25 feet is about as far as I go on a clearance line. Put the clearance line somewhere secure. I've got a different bag on today. It's going in my pocket. 
the clearance line it's not edible the clearance line is your safety net if you haven't got your owl trained yet and at this stage of course you haven't oh, hold on hold on the clearance line stops your owl flying away maybe flying somewhere dangerous getting mobbed by crows something like that when it isn't trained well enough to come back to you and before we even get to this point We've weighed our owl, we've made a daily log of its weight, really important because it gives even the relative newbie an insight into the condition and the mentality that owl will be in at that point in time. We're not training the bird as soon as we've fed its full dinner, it doesn't want to do anything. Predators in the wild that are full up, they don't go hunting and we're working on that, that principle. We need an edge on her appetite. Let's look at some Korean slime problems around us, some things to think about. If we put her on here, and there's a nail, wait a second, and there's a nail sticking out the back, the lion could get on there and snag her. If we let her fly back and allow the lion to wrap around here, the lion will snag her. You're going to shatter her confidence. She's trying to come to you, and she gets snagged on something. Look at this. Tar oozing out of the woodwork. Today, no problem at all. It's three degrees. It's freezing. This stuff's not a problem at all in the freezing cold. Have a look up here. Lots of branches. One thing we see a lot of is people using really long creance lines next to a tree. And they haven't worked out in their brains that the creance line's long enough to reach the tree branches. So she spooks. Something comes around the corner she's never seen before. Any bird is going to want to go up high. The higher it can get, looking down on the problem, the safer it feels. So she spooks. She flies up to the branches on a creance line. Now we've got a huge problem. She's tangled up there. I can't climb that tree, she can't get down. How's that gonna end? So be spatially aware every time you're out with your birds, but for sure, when they're on a creance line, think about the problems that could occur. Let's see what she'll do. Keep, one of the, keep the slack of the creance line under the control of your little finger. Remember, she's already trained. We're using her as, a, as an example. Remember, owls can't see close up. So if we were to put a little tiny bit of food in our glove, like we would for our diurnal raptors, when she lands, she can't see it anymore. So we always feed to the fist. We always feed to the beak. So let me get a little bit of food. <laughs> Hold on a second, Bob. Hold on a second. Have a little bit. We feed all of our owls directly to the beak. So let's show you. Pitch line under control. We use hand signals to call the birds. <coughs> Feed her directly to a beak. Don't expect her to find it on the glove. It's really difficult for now to do that. Be aware of the clean line, wrapping around the posts or nails. Keep an eye on it. <coughs> with all of our birds, including the owls, we don't just have a sound that we, we call them with. And we do that even when their little owlet's being hand fed. We make that sound at the point the food goes into their beak. That triggers that response, just like whistling your dog. So hold on. Hold on. <coughs> Send the back. This is the sound for her. Hand signals. There you are. The white of your hand can be seen a long way away. Use a hand signal. Hand signals. Sound. Any sounds you like, you can call its name, you can whistle. My owls do a lot of flying indoors in school halls. I don't want to be whistling, it echoes. I don't want to be shouting, there's no need. With a barn owl especially, I make a barn owly noise. <laughs> Feed her to a beak. And it's that simple. All we need to do now is extend the clearance line, being aware of where it can go. Keep everything away from trees. You don't want any tangles. So if your owl is coming repetitively, pretty much as you call her, extend the clearance line a little bit more. You're looking for repetitiveness, remember, not great distances. Send her back. Everything you can to avoid a tangle on the line. Glove up, signal, psh, 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 give her a call. The hand signal can be just as important as the sound you make to call her. Watch the clearance line on the ground. Things are sticking up on the ground and they can equally snag her. Now, when it comes to the reward, 
You don't need huge bits of food. Remember, owls don't have a crop like the other birds. They don't have a, a pouch to store their food in before it goes into their stomach. Everything with an owl goes straight into its stomach, unlike the diurnal raptors. We're feeding small bits. Look at this. It's a little bit of day-old chick thigh. This is the kind of size we're feeding, and you don't need to feed them every single time. They'll come on the chance that there's usually a reward there. And that way, you can stretch out her flying time, more repetitions, without filling the owl right up. Once its tummy's full, it wants to go to sleep, just like when your tummy's full. Absolutely. So, little rewards. If she does something really big, really great, give her a bigger reward. So she learns that something really special gets her an extra reward. Maybe when she does her first circuit without landing, give her a bigger reward, even if you end it there. They really respond, birds of prey, to reward for what they're doing. And we certainly always give bumper rewards when our birds first do something. If this is the first time you've got your owl outside on the creance, if she comes three or four times, call it a day. Feed her well for the last one, call it a day. The first one, however, the owl that you've hand reared, the owl that'll, even without food, will probably fly across your room or fly through its enclosure when it's a little owlet as soon as it can to be with you or for a bit of food. Outside can be a different world altogether. So you might find, you might find the hardest flight of your owl's life outdoors is a foot. For some reason, when you train birds of prey, most of them are incredibly nervous to make that first jump. And we're talking a jump across open space. Once she does that, you're on your way. Don't be frustrated if she doesn't dare come. If she won't do anything, then she won't jump at all. See if she'll just, hold on. See if she'll just, literally walk along the glove, put your elbow on her perch, just get her to realize she's got to come for food. And this is where your daily weight management comes in. Because with her, with a bird, you can't see if she's fat or thin. And often with the birds of prey, to encourage them to begin to do something, they need an edge on their appetite. So if she doesn't come, even this far, just give her half her normal day's rations. She's still getting fed, well fed, but she's been a bit short changed. Tomorrow at about the same time, she'll be hungrier than she was today. Try again, but don't not feed her food and expect her to do miracles. We're talking to get that initial response, even if it is just walking along your glove for a bit of food. Every day, log the weight. Barn owls are incredibly small. They're an incredibly, I dare I say, slightly silly bird to get as your first bird to train, whatever species. The smaller the bird of prey, if you're training it to fly well, the more critical your weight management needs to be. You need to understand its weight and understand its body language. Because for sure, an owl that only weighs between nine and a half and 12 ounces flying weight, hasn't got a very large window of being in the zone and it's easy on cold nights for your owl to go underweight. And if it goes underweight and you're a novice, you're probably gonna lose that bird. That's not fair on the bird. So be meticulous with your weight management and be meticulous with your feeding. Do not think if you don't feed your young owl until it flies to you, it will be okay. You'll have a dead owl, it's that simple. This is what you're working with more than anything else. You're working with the bird's brain. You're not working it entirely through its tummy. It needs an edge on its appetite to create confidence in its brain to do what you're asking of that bird. Appetite, yes, starvation, you'll have a dead barn owl. So you've got your owl, you've got her on the creance. Everything's going well, you've got some good distance. We've got a good tangle now because we've walked on the thing. We've got some good distance. Not only have we got some good distance, we're not going to go far for the purposes of this, but you've got your owl not only flying a reasonable distance, you've got response. She's not had any food now for about 10 flights. Let's give her a little bit. She's, we've got great response. She just wants to come, be with me, and get a reward. So it's time for free flying. If she weighs more tomorrow when we're going to fly her free than she does today, and she was good today, 
maybe manage her weight so she's back at that exact same weight as she was today when she was doing well on her clearance before you fly her free. It's very easy when the bird's flying this responsively to overfeed her. It's a, such a great, it's such a great feeling. Your owl psh, psh, comes when you call, distracted by nothing, and you get carried away. And you think tomorrow I'll fly her free. First time for a few days, you've fed her more than ever. Try and get her on that weight that she flew well today. Before we go to free flying, there's some things we really need to talk about. If you live in suburbia and you think you're going to fly and train your owl in your garden, there's only one safe way you can fly that owl in your garden, one only, on a short creance. If you fly that owl free in your garden with no telemetry, we'll come to that in a second, you will lose that owl. It will more than likely die because if it's loose, it's spooked and um, uh, a murder, a group of crows see that owl, they're gonna try their best to kill it. Equally in suburbia, your owl will starve anyway if you don't find it soon. The only way, let me repeat it one more time, to fly your owl in your suburban garden outside is on a creance line. If you don't use a creance line, you will lose that owl. It will more than likely die. If you think, that's okay, I've got radio telemetry, I can track my owl. Tracking and getting an owl back, or any bird, in a suburban garden environment is incredibly different, difficult. Having telemetry isn't a foolproof way to rescue your owl. If you're flying in a garden, the clearance line for most of us would need to be very short. It needs to be short enough that it can't tangle on washing lines, short enough she can't fly over the next door neighbor's hedge and you're trying to pull her back. Find somewhere proper to fly your owl. And that way really means talking to farmers and landowners somewhere nice, well away from public footpaths and other people's dogs. We're gonna give her one more fly and then we're gonna talk about telemetry and then we're gonna meet one of our other barn owls, Lily, and talk about free flying, which is obviously the best way to fly any bird of prey. So before we go and ask Joe to fly Lily for you, let's talk about telemetry. If you fly your owl free and you don't use telemetry, you are saying, my owl didn't cost me a lot of money, I don't care if I lose her, I'll buy another one. You can't be saying anything else because if you don't use telemetry with your owl, you're going to lose your owl. And there'll be people watching this saying, I fly my owl in my garden all the time, I've done it for two years. They'll lose their owl. It's gonna happen. As we always say in these videos, when we seem to be being pompous and patronizing, we're giving you the benefit of our wisdom. And we've learned our wisdom the hard way. We've done all these things. I lost a barn owl when I was a kid because I didn't want to buy telemetry. My barn owl cost me 75 pounds. Telemetry was hundreds of pounds back then. I didn't want to do it. I thought, oh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It's fine. Lost it in the end. You will lose it. If you look on the internet on certain lost and found birds of prey pages, there are so many owls mostly barn owls and harris hawks lost every week in the UK. It's a disgrace to British falconry, if you can call it falconry. It's a disgrace to British bird of prey keeping because it doesn't need to happen. If telemetry is too expensive, scour the advert pages, try and find yourself a second hand equipment. Barn owls don't tend to fly overly far if you lose them, so you don't need the latest, most powerful telemetry equipment. If you can't afford telemetry, you can't afford to keep and fly a barn owl free. It's, it is that simple, you know? I wouldn't mind having a Ferrari now and again on a Sunday afternoon, just have a little whiz around the country lanes. I can't afford a Ferrari. I haven't got a Ferrari. That's the way, that's life, unfortunately. If you can't afford to care for that animal, you can't afford to buy the animal. Don't do it, it's really important. Telemetry with owls, we either leg mount them, we cable tie them to their anklet, never around the leg itself, we cable tie them to their anklet, and some of our large owls, we put a tail mount clip on, like we would for many of our display diurnal birds of prey. It doesn't really matter how you attach it, as long as it's attached safely for the bird, and you've attached that telemetry, and you've tested it works for sure. Don't worry about it dangling down. It's not going to interfere with your hunting hawk, because your owl, almost likely, is going to be a bird you fly for pleasure only. So we're going to go and find Jo. We're going to ask her to fly Lily so we can see some different flying in this area. Remember, 
this owl's experience, but today we've used her as a prop. By the way, we always tell people birds of prey don't like being stroked. I've been keeping owls since I was 16, and for sure, some owls that you bond with and you hand rear from a chick, they do like to be stroked. If you can look at this and tell me that this bird isn't enjoying what I'm doing, I think you're pretty crazy. Look at her ears, by the way. She loves her ears being tickled, and a barn owl's ears are some crazy, crazy looking things. Of course, a little tickle on the head is one thing. Constantly stroking your owl like this is actually damaging those feathers. It's damaging the feathers. So don't do this, but for sure, some of them, they like a little tickle on the head. Come on, let's go and find Lily, come on. We're just walking back to find Joe and Lily. And Georgia, the camera lady, just mentioned something very important about the flying weights of birds, because it's so very critical. It's life and death if you get it wrong for your owl. The flying weight that you gradually decreased your bird down to, to get those initial flights or that initial hop, just to build its confidence, you're, you're making it hungry enough that it's not so worried about what's going on, it wants the food. That flying weight is not your owl's flying weight. It was the weight it needed to be to increase its appetite just enough to get some confidence. Once it does a job well, you can increase that weight and often you can increase it by a substantial amount. So never think of a flying weight as a static weight because you might keep your owl for the rest of its life incredibly hungry. There's absolutely no need to at all. Later, you might ask the owl to do something else. You might need to take it down to that tighter weight just to give it that confidence boost. But very quickly remember, start increasing that rate gradually over the next few days and you'll find it'll do just the same thing now at the weight you started from that it would do nothing. So never think of the flying weight as a static weight. It's a common error that many falconers make themselves. Okay, basic telemetry set. We've got a transmitter and with our barn owls we'll just cable tie that to the bird's anklet, not its ankle. And this is the receiver that locates this transmitter attached to your bird. This is made by Marshall different makes that manufacture different kinds of set. The basic kit is a radio transmitter found by a receiver. It's simple, it's a difference between finding your lost owl and your lost owl never being found and dying. Always, always use telemetry on your owl. watching. I hope that helps some people that have sort of gone down the road of barn owl without really giving it a lot of thought and you do need to give these things a lot of thought really. hope it gives you some tips and advice. Hopefully it does the owls themselves some good. Don't forget like and subscribe to see what's coming next. Cheers guys.